Detroit Lions mandatory minicamp is set to begin, and there are going to be a lot of storylines that come out from mandatory minicamp. And of course, Jeremy Reisman, proud of Detroit, put out what they're looking for for mandatory minicamp. And I'm going to go through, look at what Jeremy uh, wrote about on prideofdetroit.com. And I'm going to give you guys what I'm looking for. And please comment down below. What are some storylines you're interested to see? Because there are some things that are coming out already that I'm going to get to that are fascinating storylines. So let's begin. Let's go through Jeremy's article here. We're going to start, and I'll have the link in the description. The first thing that Jeremy writes is the attendance, because, again, you want to see who's going to be there, whether it's injury-related or simply veterans that want to rest. So let's read what Jeremy wrote. Uh, he put here, over the last two weeks of OTAs, there have been a dozen players missing, although most appear to be injury-related. Looking at our attendance list from last week, there are just a few veteran players who haven't appeared and may be back for minicamp, but their return raises some interesting questions. For example, if Anzalone is back, who will be the starting Mike linebacker, Jack Campbell or Derek Barnes? Barnes has been limiting himself, but it could be telling which players repping with the starters during walkthroughs. Additionally, will we see any of the offensive line starters? We know Taylor Decker and Frank Ragnow are resting off-season injuries, but could either of them be back for a set of mandatory practices? Finally, I'm curious to see if Marcus Davenport shows up. At this point, it's not clear if his absence is injury-related, but given how often he's been hurt in the past, his attendance at minicamp could be very reassuring. Now, for at least for attendance, yeah, I'm not as obsessed with uh, you know an Anzalone or a Frank Ragnow or Taylor Decker being in attendance. You know, it'd be great, but at the same time, we know what those guys bring. I mean, Anzalone, we know what kind of player he is. Same with Frank Ragnow. Same with Taylor Decker especially with Frank and Taylor, I think them being healthy and getting rest, I don't think those guys need reps like a Jack Campbell or a Colby Sorsdahl or a Gio Manu, those types of players. So I'm not I'm not going to overreact to this stuff. Like minicamp for me is you get guys, younger guys, that get to come in and kind of acclimate themselves into the lineup, into the roster, and just get experience and show improvement, which I'm going to get to a player in a little bit here later that – I think could be someone to watch not only for minicamp, but moving forward this off season. So Frank Ragnow and Taylor, the injuries they've dealt with. I think the last concern of mine is whether they show up to training camp or not. I think those guys being healthy should be the number one priority. And with those guys healthy now with Kevin Zeitler, we know what kind of offensive line this shit, this is. So, you know, I'm, I'm not too concerned about it, but Jeremy also wrote uh, for the next thing he's looking for is the starting corners. In week one of OTAs, we saw Carlton Davis at the CB1 spot playing opposite of Kendall Vildor with rookie Terran Arnold sideline for most team drills. In week two, Arnold was the CB1 opposite of Vildor, and Davis was nowhere to be found. If the Lions come out of minicamp with both Davis and Arnold as full, full participants, it could be our first look at the Detroit Lions' highly anticipated starting cornerback lineup of 2024. And that is a very interesting storyline, not just for those two, but for Really, the amount of corners they have that are capable starters, and and I've talked about it on this channel that Amik Robertson is someone that to kind of look out for, because I think with his versatility, he can play uh, in a couple different positions on in your secondary. He can play in the slot. He's a true outside corner. I think that's where he excels. But I am curious. You know, I think the easy prediction would be Carlton Davis and Terry on Arnold. I, I I mean, Kendall Vildor is out there just getting reps. That's really all he's doing. But it's nice. You know, you get to douse Taron Arnold and all the, the CB1 reps and, and kind of get him acclimated because if he's going to be playing on the other side of Carlton Davis, we already know what types of receivers he's going to face in the NFC North. I mean, you're, you're talking about Jordan Addison. You're talking about a Keenan Allen or a DJ Moore, depending on what who matches up with who better. And then we haven't even got to the Packers, who have a, a, a good young wide receiver core. So, you know, Taron Arnold getting these reps are so important. I know Ennis Rakestraw dealing with some things. He's still limited. He's somebody that's just going to learn. And, and to be honest, guys, I'm going to tell you this right now. And I don't know how you guys feel about this. But I don't know if Rakestraw will be playing immediately when the season begins. This Lions team, we've seen it with players that are more ready than others, right? Jameer Gibbs, even he, you know, it took some time for him to get the the touches that I think people expected him to get when he was first drafted. And I know Ennis Rakestraw, there's there's hope that he could be out there in the starting lot in the starting lineup, which again, this the whole starting thing is a little overrated within itself. Like if you're just playing reps, if you're playing snaps, that's really all that matters. And to be honest, I think Ennis is 
I think this year for him, majority of it should be just learning. They have enough guys. I mean, they, I think Terion should play, but Carlton Davis and Meek Robertson, I mean, you haven't even gotten to Emmanuel Mosley, who has two bad knees, but still, he's still Emmanuel Mosley, and we know before the injuries, he was a hell of a player. So, you know, I, I think with Ennis, it's about being a little more patient and, and him just getting reps out there, you know, even with even if it's not with the first team or the second team, just being out there in practice, uh, even though he's limited, I think is a good thing. So, you know, Terron and Carlton, my, I believe, will be your starting number one and number two corner. But I think Amik Robertson could definitely contend and potentially even play in the slot, um, assuming they put Brian Branch at, at, at safety, which is his true position. But he played really well in the slot. And we're going to get to who the safety, which safety has been really turning heads in, in a little bit here because it does kind of tie into that conversation. But we'll continue. Jeremy writes, uh, for the next thing, which w- will any rookies get promotions? The Lions have made it pretty standard that rookies have to work their way up from the bottom of the depth chart. At the same time, if a player starts to prove themselves, even as a rookie, they will not shy away from giving those players opportunities. With two weeks of OTAs in the books, is it possible for any rookie? Uh, is it possible any rookies have earned more opportunities to open practice? The Lions populate both fields for walkthroughs. One side has the starters and a few rotations. The other side is clear backups and roster bubble players. Through the two practices, I've only seen Arnold and Vaki as on the starter side. Will anyone join them this week? And that ties into what I just said about Ennis. I think Ennis was more participating with the guys who are backups. Um, and, and, of course, he's already limited. But Vaki and Arnold are guys that I think are – they're throwing them out there to see what they got. I mean, Vaki's competing not only just to be on special teams, like he's going to be on the roster, but to potentially be a running back three. And that's a hell of a competition they have. I mean, you have Zonovan Knight, Craig Reynolds, Jamar Jefferson, Vaki now. You know, so that running back three spot, and not just that, but who makes the practice squad, that, that's going to be really one of the biggest storylines to watch. I know Jeff Risden dove into that on his uh, his uh, OTA takeaways, and he did a great job. So it, it is one of the best, at least the, the the best competitions to watch out for. I know it's not as exciting, but it, it still is a competition that we're going to see who makes the roster and gets the backup, Jameer and David Montgomery. Jer- uh, Jeremy also writes here, who will step up as wide receiver three? We know Amon Ross St. Brown is a starter. We know expectations are high for Jameis Williams in year three, but who will be the Lions receiver who joins them in the starting lineup? As of right now, it appears to be a three-man race. Donovan Peoples-Jones, Antoine Green, and Khalif Raymond. None of them have really had standout practices thus far, but it's very early. Filling in Josh Reynolds' role is not something that should be overlooked. And we've talked about this on our live show a ton. Um, I-, I think you know that competition is another one that people should be watching for. In my opinion, Donovan Peoples-Jones is more than capable of fulfilling some of that production. You know, Josh Reynolds was solid. I know people, it's what have you done for me lately? And the last thing we see of Josh Reynolds is dropping some passes in the biggest game of the Lions season. So not everyone hates him. But in reality, he was very reliable. He was very solid. But Donovan Peoples-Jones has shown in the past that he could put up numbers. But you still have Khalif Raymond, who's a very reliable receiver. Someone who can play special teams as well. And somebody that Jared Goff... In, in certain situations, has shown he can rely on. So I, I think the true competition, although I do like Antoine Green, and I, I think I do think there's some potential there for him to see the field this year. I think the real race, in my opinion, is Khalif Raymond and Donovan Peoples-Jones. And I, I have Donovan Peoples-Jones ultimately winning that. I've always been a little higher on DPJ, though. You know, I'm not a Michigan fan, but he is a hell of a player. Uh, and I just think, you know, him getting here in the middle of the season last year, it was hard for him to catch up. It's a complex offense to learn. And you had an offense that was already buzzing. So, you know, the times he was out there, you know, he, he kind of seemed like the odd man out. And I don't think – I don't really blame all that on DPJ. I think a full offseason now, we'll get to training camp when pads get put on. That's what's going to matter, and I think DPJ will ultimately shine. So I'm, I'm very excited for DPJ and see what he can do. And I like Khalif, but DPJ could really be that Josh Reynolds guy in my opinion. Uh, but let's keep it pushing because this next uh, part that Jeremy talks about is what I wanted to get into. We are we are likely uh, we aren't likely to see Kirby Joseph or Brian Branch this week as they continue to recover from all season procedures. However, one common criticism of Lions offseason is their failure to address the depth of that position. The only addition was adding or re-signing CJ Moore after his indefinite suspension was lifted. Can Moore justify Detroit's inaction? Brandon Joseph is a near two and has been getting starter reps alongside uh, Ifitu Malafonwu. Is he turning into a capable defender, or will some of the new depth UDFA's? Uh, Shailene Gar- uh, Garns or Lauren Strickland make a noticeable impact. Now, guys, and, and this is what I was waiting for. Brandon Joseph, 
if people don't forget, uh, Northwestern guy also played at Notre Dame. He's a hell of a player, by the way, in college. And I know he was he was an undrafted free agent last year, but you look at Brandon Joseph and Dan Campbell praised him. I think he said most recently that he wanted to get him on the roster last year, but just couldn't. Like he he has the tools, and I, I had a chance to watch him in the preseason, and I believe he had a pick. I could be wrong, but I believe he had a pick last preseason. You guys would have to correct me on that. But I like Brandon Joseph. And I, I think for C.J. Moore, he's an excellent special teams player. But if we're talking about is he a capable defender, I like Brandon Joseph's upside. Like, I I, I, I don't know if you, you would be able to throw him out there and, and he could play significant reps or snaps or anything like that. But I think just as the player, judging by what he did in college, and obviously we know Brad Holmes, so anyone that he attaches his name to, I'm immediately intrigued. And, and I think Brandon Joseph is one of the storylines to watch. You know, in the safety room, although they have enough, they have safeties. But in certain instances where if there is an injury, which there are right now, but I'm talking during the season, could Brandon Joseph be the next man up? That's probably, you know, a bigger storyline than people think. And, and and I think Brandon Joseph will be capable now another year uh, with this defense. And you got to think, guys, undrafted for agents. I know when you hear about it, you're like, ah, the guy's undrafted. There's, a, there's plenty of players in the league that have had success that are undrafted for agents. So got to keep that in mind. So I'm saying it right now. Watch out for Brandon Joseph. He could be a sneaky player to pay attention to as training camp approaches and as the season approaches. We'll get to see him certainly in the preseason. But let's keep going because Jeremy Reisman also talked about the kicker battle. He writes, while I still think Michael Badgley is the heavy favorite to keep the kicker job going over two last week during the situational drills compared to James Turner certainly opens up a window for the rookie for Michigan. And while I don't plan on spending a ton of time watching the long snappers is worth at least acknowledging the Lions brought in competition for Scott Daly. And I don't think Hogan Hatton is just a camp body. So we're not going to spend too much time on the, on the long snapper battle. Sorry about that. But the kicker battle is going to be very interesting because Jeff Risden, and I'm glad he, he put this out because I do, I respect Jeff a lot. And uh, he, he wrote how he watched Michael Badgley nail like 15, straight uh, field goals, and he even was kicking field goals from 60 yards. And then you had that report come out that, you know, he was 0 for 2 and James Turner knocked him down. It is going to be a kicker battle. I think Michael Badgley, all jokes aside, all the worries I have about him, he is going to win that kicker battle. And, you know, I, I think Badgley is fine. I think he's fine. He's not someone that I think, oh, you have the position figured out. But given Dan Campbell's philosophy on coaching and, and how he is going to be aggressive, you know, you, you got to look at that. And also Michael Badgley, can he can he be consistent from 40 to 50? Yes, he can. Now, if he's showing improved leg strength, we will see. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and be just obsessed with guys that have cannon legs, you know, uh, that aren't as accurate from closer than 50. Because there are kickers that are like that. Joey Sly, he he I forgot what team he signed with, but he's a kicker in the National Football League who is just money from 60 yards. But you're talking 40 to 50, he's not as good. And I guess it's like pick your flavor. Would you rather have a consistent kicker or someone that struggles or, or struggles kicking? Or a consistent kicker that can make 40 to 50 yard field goals or someone that can hit bombs but struggles to make those? And I think we'd all agree that you want the consistency. Now, last year, Michael Badgley, there's times where it felt like the coaching staff didn't trust him. And we don't really have that answer, certainly. And he hit a, a very important field goal against the against the Rams, which ultimately won the game at the end. I mean, you won by one point. And there was a lot of things that won the game. But you get what I'm trying to say here. I think Michael Badgley's fine. And I think he's going to win this battle. At least he should. I, I don't think James Turner is uh, is, is going to outkick Michael Badgley or win that, that starting spot, in my opinion. So it is an interesting storyline to follow and, and to see who what kickers get released and do they bring in more competition? And I think they certainly should. Competition breeds success, especially in the kicker room, which you don't really have figured out, in my opinion, at the moment. You just have someone that's kind of stable, which is okay. But of course, like any other position, you want to continually try to upgrade it, right? But these are some of the things that Jeremy wrote, and I do agree with some of the, the most of what he said about what to watch out for from the Lions mandatory mini camp. But the question I have for you guys is what are you looking for? You know, I've already kind of said what I'm looking for and, and whether I agree with Jeremy or not. And you guys should go read their stuff, pride 
But I, I think my favorite thing to watch personally, just because not a lot of people are talking about it, is Brandon Joseph in that safety room. Uh, because I, 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 he's just a great story. He really is. So comment down below. What do you guys think? What are you watching for? And uh, what are some storylines that you're the most interested in? Don't forget to subscribe. We just hit 7.3 thousand subscribers. Thanks to you guys. And like the video. It helps. It pushes the video out in the algorithm. And I appreciate it. Until next time, I'll catch you guys.